Well, the biggest challenge is that melanoma cells, which come from melanocytes, are basically cancer stem cells. And so the problem is that the melanocyte lives for about 10 years in the skin. So that's one of the more longer live cells. Of course, brain cells live our whole lifetime, but if we're nice to ourselves, but the uh, melanoma is attached to a keratinocyte and it gives off the melanin to the keratinocyte. There's like seven keratinocytes getting melanin that's pumped up through these little fingers into the keratinocyte. And then the melanin forms an umbrella over the nucleus of the keratinocyte to protect it from UV radiation. And when you get a sunburn, if you don't have a lot of pigment, like blue eyed people like myself, we have less pigment. It's more labile, more capable of being killed, that keratinocyte. And its job is basically to keep the melanocytes sitting right there and to not divide ever. And when it dies, now the melanocyte starts to divide because the keratinocyte isn't stopping it anymore. And all the mutations that it sustained in the DNA for 10 years are now manifest. And so the cancer with the most mutations is melanoma. Has more mutations per person than any other cancer type. Now, so that that's it's an Achilles heel because the mutation, the mutant proteins, now we have drugs to help the immune system recognize those proteins and kill the melanoma. But because it is, it, there are so many mutations and it turns on this cancer stem cell phenotype, it, it has no real response to chemotherapy. So when I was training at the National Cancer Institute, I was across the hall from Steve Rosenberg. He was the chief of the surgery branch and he focused on melanoma. And he was just getting into till therapy at that time. And he was harvesting tumors from melanoma patients, growing them in a Petri dish, and then he would take out the T cells that had gone into the tumor and expand their numbers, these tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And he would infuse them back into the patients and patients would respond. And the other thing that he was developing at that time was interleukin-2, which is a signaling molecule from helper T cells that when the helper T cell and the macrophage get together, they form a dynamic duo then releases interleukin-1, interleukin-2, interleukin-1 from the macrophage, interleukin-2 from the T helper cell, and it goes to the killer cell, which is attached to the cancer cell. And when it gets that interleukin-2 signal, it turns on and it releases its bombs, porphyrin and gramzyme B, to kill the cancer cell. And so he was just starting this when I was there. Uh, and uh, when I finished fellowship, I uh, came back to California, was practicing at UC Irvine, and I started to use interleukin-2. And about 10% of people could be cured, but 90% they didn't benefit from it. But that told us the immune system could be marshaled against cancer and melanoma. That was what it taught us. And we were using the same therapy in kidney cancer. So we tried combining it with chemotherapy thinking that immunotherapy and chemotherapy together might carry the day, but uh, there was no statistically significant improvement in survival with those approaches. So basically the chemotherapy regimens we were using in the 90s called the Dartmouth Regimen, Platinum Therapy, Decarbazine, these drugs, they were not improved. They were, there was no survival advantage, zero. Kidney cancer also, no survival advantage from chemotherapy for kidney cancer. So these two cancers that did seem to respond to immunotherapy were completely impervious to getting chem to chemotherapy, to responding to chemotherapy. So people worked on the question, okay, if interleukin-2 works, maybe there's something better. And uh, uh, a Japanese scientist uh, discovered there was a sword sticking out of the cancer that could kill the T cells. Hanjo, in Tokyo, discovered this protein called program death ligand, PDL1. And it was sticking out of the cancer cell surface. And when it would engage the T cell that's trying to kill it, 
the PD-1 receptor would attach to the PD-1, PD-L1 ligand, and that would uncouple the T-cell receptor from signaling, which is essential for the survival of the T-cell. So when it uncoupled the T-cell receptor, T-cell can't function and it dies. It's like pulling out the stinger from a bee. So the, the people said, all right, well, here's this PDL one that's a checkpoint. Normally it's turning the immune system off so you don't overreact to viruses. When the cold is over, you want your sore throat to go away, which is basically from the immune system attacking the cells that are virally infected. And when they're gone, you need to turn it off. That's what checkpoint inhibitors do. And there was another checkpoint inhibitor over on the macrophage helper cell interaction, the dynamic duo called CTLA-4. That was also a Nobel Prize winning discovery uh, by a scientist at MD Anderson. And so then antibodies came along against these two checkpoint inhibitors, Yervoy, which attacked CTLA-4, and uh, Keytruda and Nivolumab, which attacked PDL one And basically when I talk to my patients, I'm saying here, you know, the sword's sticking out, it's gonna kill the, can the T cell, the, the, the sword from the cancer cell. So we're gonna put a shield up with the antibody so it cannot kill the T cell and the T cell can kill the cancer cell. And of course I think the interleukin two signal, which is important for the T cell to be activated, is normally shut down by the CTLA-4 off switch. So the antibody against CTLA-4 blocks turning off interleukin-2, and now you've got more interleukin-2, you're protecting the killer T cell, and voila. The 10-year survival paper just came out in the New England Journal of Medicine for the combination of nivolumab and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Yervoy, about a 48% survival at 10 years so basically about half the people are cured but when i came out of fellowship at nci the average survival was 10 months and most people are done at a year uh, or a year and a half so it was a terrible disease it was hard to be an oncologist who took care of melanoma patients so that was the first huge breakthrough um and uh first we had your void the ctla4 antibody we started using that as adjuvant therapy, even after surgery, we'll give it to people. Maybe it'll keep it from coming back. And for stage four disease, and then nivolumab came along, we combined those, and that was a huge breakthrough. Keytruda came along, it blocked PD PDL1. It was highly effective. Uh, and uh, now Keytruda is the leading drug in the world because it's used in many, many different cancer types now, but we, it, we were first in melanoma to use these drugs. So that was a big breakthrough. And then the second big breakthrough was a discovery of a mutation in a protein called BRAF. And normally there's receptors on the surface of the cell and they get a ligand and a signal goes into the cell. And there's a circuit that sends the signal downstream into the nucleus so the cell can divide and stay alive. So these, these receptor tyrosine kinases, they're called because they use, uh, they phosphorylate a, a tyrosine amino acid when they're working. And it's basically attaching phosphate groups to the circuits downstream that determines if that circuit is on. So if a, a receptor binds a ligand and then the, the ligand goes away, the signal stops. So BRAF is like number two or three, you could say in the circuit system. And when it's mutated at the 600 position of the amino acids in the protein, it's permanently on. So the V600E BRAF mutation was discovered uh, and people said, well, let's try and inhibit that enzyme, the BRAF enzyme. And vemurafenib was developed by Genentech. And vemurafenib had a significant impact on BRAF mutant positive patients with melanoma, improving survival from the 10 months to, let's say, 12 to 15 months, which is an improvement, but it's not like people were, you know, there were complete responders, but the resistance occurred because there's the, the MEC, BRAF sits above MEC. And so BRAF would phosphorylate MEC, you block that, but MEC could still be phosphorylated by a workaround called CRAF. 
So they said, okay, let's not let both of those go. Let's hit both of those with a, a blocker drug. So Genent, uh, GSK developed um, the, a, a BRAF inhibitor called dabrafenib and a MEK inhibitor called trametinib. And that was the first doublet to significantly change the melanoma landscape because now we had a 69% response rate versus 40% response rate, 50% response rate for immunotherapy. So response means the tumor shrinks by at least 30%. The sum of the tumor uh, in the body would shrink by 30%. So this was big, and then 20% had complete responses with the BRAF MEK drugs. So that has been really the foundation uh, since the, you know, uh, 2012, 2015, 2000, you know, that time frame um, for, uh, you know, moving forward. Now, people, there's like uh, sort of a me too type situation. So lag is also an off switch. Lag three is a protein on T cells and K cells, other cells. And it's felt to play a role in maintaining tolerance. So in other words, we wouldn't, our T cells go through school in the thymus to learn not to react against us. So they are tolerant to self. And there's regulatory cells that maintain tolerance. And uh, oh, a little frozen there. So there's, there's the tolerance um, is, we think is helped maintain by lag three. So an antibody against lag three could enable the immune system to attack the self more easily. And since the cancer comes from self, that's thought to be its mechanism of working with nivolumab in the drug Opduolag. And so the uh, relatlimab is the you know antibody against lag three and urovoid and nivolumab and they're combined together. And uh, the, the treatment outcomes um, are almost identical, just slightly less benefit than nivolumab combined with urovoid. But it's just one infusion, which has some advantage to it. And the, now the original uh, papers for urovoid and nivolumab used a dosing, uh, which wasn't the best because they were giving three milligrams per kilogram of urovoid and one milligram per kilogram of nivolumab. And I had so many people get side effects from that dosing. People in the hospital for three or four weeks with diarrhea from colitis, from immune mediated colitis. And so the, the study was done to flip the dose and now have, instead of Yervoy three, have it as one and nivolumab as three instead of one. And that combination had identical clinical activity but significantly less toxicity. So when we look at this landscape of toxicity, cost benefit ratio for these drugs, it looks like uh, Abdulag, while it's active, it was first thought to be maybe less toxic, but when you, and they, in their paper, they described there's less toxicity when they compared it to the original trials. But when you compare it now to the, Newer study with the flip dose, the volume of your voice, it's about the same. And it's slightly less successful in, in terms of overall survival. We're talking about 2% less benefit with uh, Opduolag compared to the your voice and the volume ab combination. So, it, it, it's, uh, so as we, you know, at Evelyn, when we think about pathways and we think about what should we include what should we reinforce positively? Because a pathway selection helps the practice save money and uh, there's a benefit to them from doing that. Something that's off pathway, they don't get the benefit. So um, our, our uh, scientific advisory board made up of practicing oncologists, um, patient uh, advocates, cancer survivors, we present the data to the, to the committee. And this is the kind of data we would show them. We would say, you know, this is not safer. This is maybe slightly less beneficial. 
And we know that Yervoy and Nivolumab, one really important thing has been brain metastases in melanoma. The leading tumor for brain metastases is melanoma because the melanocytes come from the neuroectoderm. They've got Velcro that sticks to like nerve tissue because melanin is made through the same process as neurotransmitters. So the melanocytes like to stick in the brain. And when they go off and circulate in the, in the blood, they'll stick in the brain. And 25% of people present with brain metastases. 50% will develop them during the course of their treatment. Except for now, we know that immunotherapy has a 50% response rate for brain metastases. And the BRAF inhibitors have a high response rate for brain metastases. So that's really changed everything. And with Gamma Knife, which is a very nice focused energy beam, we can target just the melanoma spot in the brain and spare the rest of the brain, unlike whole brain radiation where people become defective cognitively. So that's one thing we don't know about Abdullah. We don't know what its activity is in the brain, whether lag three will be similar to your void in terms of immune cell penetration and activity against brain metastases. So that's an unknown right now. And uh, so we're, we're going to be sticking with, you know, the Yervoy nivolumab <clears throat> combination for people with brain metastases for sure, because there's no data for Abdolag. And, uh, you know, now there are clinical trials studying combinations of immunotherapy with BRAF drugs. So for instance, tezolizumab can be given in melanoma. It's a PD-1 antibody. It can be given with uh, uh, vemurafidim cotelic, which is the BRAF mech inhibitor that Genentech makes. And there are more studies going on combining BRAF mech with immunotherapy as a step forward. And then to bring it, you know, to kind of all the way around 360, uh, Rosenberg's efforts with interleukin-2 until therapy were rewarded with the recent FDA approval of that approach for melanoma patients. So now there's a company, you take the patient biopsy and you send it to the company. They process it, take out, get the till cells, send them back and you infuse the till cells into the patient. You have to give chemotherapy first. And uh, that's where the toxicity comes because the chemotherapy will kill some of the immune effector cells that would suppress the, the till cells from working. So the regulatory cells are killed by the chemotherapy. You give the till therapy and then you have to give interleukin two. So we're back to the old fashioned interleukin two on this regimen, give it six times. So when I was, I probably have given more interleukin two than anybody in Orange County over the years. Uh, and it's a very hard drug to give. People are monitored around the clock in the hospital when you give it. I give it as a continuous infusion it, and people get really low blood pressure. They've got to have 250 cc's of saline running continuously. There's about five liters of extra fluid you got to put into them because of the vasodilation from interleukin two to keep their blood pressure up. So that's one of the more challenging things. And so there's only certain centers that can do the tilt therapy right now. It's UCLA near where I live. Uh, and so while this is a new therapy and it does have benefit, there's about a 30% response rate for refractory patients, which is good but it's very complicated and, and challenging to the patient to go through it.